welcome to the Applied Category Seminar. Um, so, I guess we had a talk last week, but this seminar, now that we're finished the course, is it's going to run weekly. Uh, it's, it's some combination of a teaching and research seminar. So we have sort of, we've had historically talks that have been quite pedagogical, um, but we've also had research level talks. We'll have one in a couple of weeks when we have a visitor. Um, I guess we had one last week, we are sort of in between. Um, it'll likely, as this semester goes on, it might switch to a, a seminar that rather than having a sort of new topic every week, we'll have some sort of continuing topic through as we try and um, tackle some sort of student project that we're organizing or just research project that we're organizing involving, involving some categorical logic, some graphical languages, and building software to implement all of these things. The room here. Here. Okay. So, so the character of the seminar uh, might change over the next couple weeks. I was just saying, um, with say some of you guys, we, will, we might move towards uh, teaching the sort of foundation for some sort of project. But this talk is meant to be standalone. Um, it's meant to be quite gentle, um, just to start things off, and it's on. Um, in particular, just something I was reading this week, um, this paper by David Elman um, called Partition Logic. So, the first half is going to be mostly pedagogical, and I'm going to talk a bit about some general category theoretic ideas, uh, and then just give a brief rundown of the contents of the paper itself. Um, okay, so. In particular, in the sort of pedagogical part, I want to sort of go over, I want to sort of talk about things from a more categorical viewpoint than I might otherwise do, despite being someone who talks about things from a categorical viewpoint all the time. But I want to get some basic definitions like monomorphisms and, and slice categories down, uh, because they're a good foundation for each talk in the seminar. So, part one is called a very abstract view. power sets. Um, why I'm talking about power sets, uh, well, um, it's because because subsets are very important in logic. So in sort of, uh, say, this basic form of logic, or propositional logic, uh, what do we have? We have um, sort of, we start with some propositions or some symbols. Um, Right, PQR and so on, um, and we have some operations like and or implies not and so on. Uh, let's just have them, um, and so we can form expressions. Um, and we form expressions these expressions or formulas like P and Q, um, and I don't know what else we're going to do. We can do not p, we can do not not p, and so on. Right, so this is fairly standard stuff. Uh, and the interesting part is we have the, this sort of we have the, all these expressions, and we can also talk about uh, deduction rules between them when one implies another. So we have things you'll be familiar with. Um, like p and q implies, well, let's say entails p or something like a distributive law that says if we do P and Q or R, that's the same as P or R, no, sorry, P and Q or P and R, right? So we have this sort of abstract formal system, um, but we can interpret these things, interpret these things in uh, as describing power sets, uh, as describing subsets of some universe set. So, um, we get, so in particular, this can be given semantics in terms of subsets. People, I guess, I'll also say models. Um, so we fix set some set U um, P. Q and R and so on, these propositions which represent subsets of U. And um, these symbols K 
kind of just represent what they look like. So the meat is the intersection, um, the drain is the union, and then this knot is complementation. Uh, and I guess implies I'll just abbreviate it as not. So if P implies Q, it represents the subset not P and Q. Oh, or Q. Um, okay, so this is standard propositional logic um, and has some sort of standard semantics for it. Um, but the idea here, then, is that propositional logic, sorry, propositional logic is a language or a logic for subsets. Um, the point of these deduction rules is that, well, the, the statement more precisely means that any deduction you make with the sort of valid deduction rules of this logic uh, correspond to true statements when you interpret them in, in any sort of model, in any interpretation of these things as subsets that you like. These things are always true about subsets. Um, so, so, in particular, it's a, a language for subsets, so it's a language for um, the power set, which is the set of subsets of you. So, what how do we think about the power set? Um, if we want to sort of generalize and, and construct logical analogs to this, what is the power set? Um, so here's a definition. Uh, first, well, here's a series of definitions. In a category C, um, let me tell you what a monomorphism is. A monomorphism um, let's call it M from C to D, so it's just a morphism, but I'm writing this, this hook error um, just because it's a standard symbol for monomorphism. Um, is a morphism such that we have this cancellation property. So for all, uh, what, size do, what size do I want? Sorry. Let's just say for all FG. Um, these are morphisms such that we can form the composites f of m and g of m, uh, g composed with m and f composed with m. Um, if these are equal, then just f is equal to g. Uh, so this looks rather abstract, but especially if you haven't seen it before. But an example is an injection. So if we pick C to be the category of sets and functions, um, then inj inj injections are monomorphisms. So how do we see this? Uh, here's an example. If we pick, say, some injection, so I'm just going to draw it like that. It's an injection from the two element set to the three element set, which maps the bottom two elements to those bottom two elements. Right, so if we call this M, um, and I have some function here, right, um, so here's say F, and here's another function G and M. Um, so when will these two things be equal? Well, if they agree up to here, then what, what decides function, uh, function equality is really whether things here map to the same thing here. But because it's an injection, we don't really change the property of mapping to the same thing. Uh, so, in particular, we can only have f equal to g if the composite with m is equal, the composite of f and m is equal to the composite of g and m. Converse, but yeah. What do you mean? Oh, if f and it's, it's an if and only f statement, yeah. right? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so this sort of way of so an injection is given. The definition of an injection is a very sort of element-wise thing. Um, that's sort of the argument I made here to think about uh, injections being monomorphisms in set. But in an abstract category, it's 
more difficult to talk about elements, um, like the, an object uh, of the, uh, I guess lots of categories we deal with. Uh, let's say the object of a poset. A poset is a category. Um, an object isn't a set with some sort of, sort of element structure inside it. So instead of, to talk about an uh, abstract definition of monomorphism, we can characterize it in terms of how the monomorphism relates to other morphisms, and in particular this, uh, it's normally called a, a left cancellation property, but it's cancellation on the right here because I'm writing my composition in a non-traditional order. So. Um, it seems that it would be not equivalent to define uh, an analog of injection element freely as like left invertible. Right, if there exists a left inverse. Mm -hmm. So why do we choose this rather than the other definition? That's a good question. Um, so, uh, like, are they both important or just monomorphism? They're to both important. This one okay. turns out to be more important. Why is that? I would say. Um, I think you're using the axiom of choice. Are you possibly using the axiom of choice? I think that's for so injections being right invertible. Yeah, right. For injections being left invertible, you're. Well, I don't Sorry. know what's that theory, so I don't know. But, uh -huh. but injections are only one side invertible, even with the axiom of choice. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying to show the surjections are right invertible. Oh, surjections, so yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. But I don't think we're injections, but uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Mm. Oh, well, that's probably yeah. the problem. sorry. <laughs> that's a, I mean, it's a good question. I don't have a good answer. Uh, I can, so the, the definition you give is known as a, with a, with a one-sided inverse, is known as split monomorphism. Um, and so there are various classes of monomorphism. Strict monomorphism is another class. Um, regular monomorphism is another class. And they all have sort of variations on these definitions, and in many categories. So in the category set, all these definitions coincide. Uh, but I, okay, I guess I guess I can give a decent answer. In a regular category, um, which is a particular sort of category, you can construct this this good notion of uh, a relation. So generalizing the or abstracting the notion of binary relation in the category of sets. Um, and so in the category of sets, uh, uh, a binary relation is a monomorphism into a product, right? It's, it's, it's a subset of a product, and so it's a monomorphism into a product. Uh, and for regular, so regular categories give you the structure to talk about monomorphisms into a product, but they, the right notion of relation happens when you use this notion of monomorphism. Um, so. That's maybe something we can explore, and we probably will explore in, in some lectures during this semester, since we'll be talking a lot about regular categories. Okay. So, um, this is an, a monomorphism. I'm going to say definition um, and epimorphism is dual to this. What does that mean? That means an epimorphism is a morphism E, uh, such that for all fg, if we do E composed with f, if E composed with f is equal to E composed with g, then f is equal to g. Okay. So, so you note that every subset S inside some subset U uh, defines a monomorphism. Um, which is just the inclusion of the set into the, the subset S into the total set U. Uh, but it's not... The, the difficulty of, of treating this categorically is that we're explicitly picking... A, a subset explicitly sort of talks about the, the elements of U. Right? Um, and from a categorical viewpoint, we're only sort of working up to isomorphism or up to sort of name change. Um, we can rename the elements, and so if we, if I picked some set S bar, which was sort of, or S, S hat, which is in bijection to S, somehow, and we took some sort of bijection here, um, this would also be a monomorphism, and somehow it talk about the same structure relative to you, even though we say change the names from a set theoretic viewpoint. Uh, so I want to not only talk about uh, subset, so, so talk about subsets, I really want to talk about, um, well, I guess the point is that I can't particularly say subset, uh, but you'll notice that every subset can be represented by more than one monomorphism. And so there's this, this problem which we encountered over the last couple of weeks, 
which is just taking care of this sort of ability to change names and not caring about that. So the way I'm going to do that today to take care of that sort of notational problem. Um, I don't understand the notational problem. I mean, it seems to me there is only one inclusion that we do give an assessment of subset theory. Okay. So I don't want to talk set theoretically. So I don't want to explicitly um, say that I want a subset of U because that involves talking about the, the very elements in U not up to some sort of mapping structure, but up to their very names itself, themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I just said I want to talk about monomorphisms into U, then I have a bunch of equivalent monomorphisms. So for example, I have this set here that sort of, and this function here that maps to the set, right? Have a bunch of but I could have taken this set here and map it in. Mm -hmm. And that would somehow represent the same. The point is that these things both pick out that element and that represents the, okay. both represents the subset there. So I want to kind of quotient by that. Um, so I also haven't really given a structure to talk about the way subsets relate to each other. Um, inclusion kind of, again, is, is very uh, element size or very non-invariant. Uh, so I want to just introduce the definition of a slice category. So given a category um, C and an object um, C in C, uh, the slice category, which we write as C over C, um, as sort of the objects and a slightly confusing are morphisms to C. Right. So the objects in the slice category are morphisms in C. And the morphisms um, are given by, if I want a morphism, so if I want to talk about the home set from A to, to B, that, so. So A is a map from some object X to C, and B is a map from some object Y to C. They're both objects in the slice category. Then a morphism is a, a morphism from X to Y in C such that it commutes. Yeah. So this diagram commutes in C. OK, so this is. This is an, a, a sort of very simple seeming de construction, uh, but it's an important sort of construction in category theory, which comes up again and again. Um, although having said that, I should give some examples, and I didn't prepare any. Do you have any off the top of your head? Oh, oh there are plenty of examples. Um, All right, well, to, hmm? well, I mean, Z is initial in ring, so in schemes, everything maps into the stack of Z, right? That's mm -hmm. maybe a good example. I'm just saying the slice category is equivalent to the original category, in that case. Yeah, but, but the cool thing is they can change things to not spec of Z, uh -huh. but spec uh -huh. of other things, right? Now. Right. Yeah. OK. So, um, so here, and for an example of a slice category, um, which pertains to the topic of hair, uh -huh, if we fix some set U, I can consider the, the category um, of monos over in set sliced over that set U. Uh, so what is this? We can consider the, given a category C, we can consider the, the, the subcategory, which has the same objects, but where the morphisms are just the monomorphisms. Um, so for that to be true, you have to check that the identity map is always a monomorphism. That should be obvious from the definition. Um, and you have to check that the composite of two monomorphisms is again a monomorphism, uh, which is a fun exercise that I encourage you to do. It takes a few lines once you see it. Um, uh, don't you need maps that are not monomorphisms to define monomorphisms in categories? So if you take out all those maps... Then, okay, so the monos in set are not the monos in the category mono set. Mm -hmm. Necessarily, actually. Oh, they are still. They're also little injections, right? So. Yeah, okay. Actually, I think that happens abstractly too. Um, so, oh. Um, I guess the answer is no. 
you, you, okay, so you're defining, let me be a bit more precise, you're defining monomorphism with respect to the category set, um, and you're constructing a new category, but that, that's just a new thing that you can do. Um, okay, so in particular, the objects in this category um, are, let's call them, monomorphisms from S into U, right? So, that's one. Hmm? Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Different so, so an, an object. Okay. It's the set of these things. Does that make it better for you? Okay. So, an object is a, is a monomorphism into U, um, and a morphism is an inclusion. Well, a monomorphism that looks like something like this. So, if S and T are a monomorph. Uh, Sets that have monomorph equipped with monomorphisms into you, then a morphism is a, between them is a monomorphism, um, and you can check that that. Uh, well, okay, that's a construction you can do. In fact, you can check by the cancellation property uh, that there's a unique morphism between any two objects. Because if we have two morphisms, then that that compose to that are morphisms between S and T, then they have to compose to this one, so they have to be equal by the cancellation property. There's at most one. Yeah, okay, there's at most one. Uh, and so in fact, this category here is a pre-order. Um, and so this sort of fact that I wanted to get at is that the power set of U um, is the skeleton so it's this thing where we have this pre-order, but we identify any two elements that are less than each other um, of this category of monos and sets sliced over you. Okay. So what does this talk about? Um, I want to get to partition logic. So in this, this talk, um, I want to dualize this whole thing picture. Um, uh, so in this talk, uh, we consider these categories or these lattices, high U, which is e uh, the dualization is. So there's two ways to dualize. One is that... Uh, what, is, what is P of U? Power, power set. Okay, this oh, is power set of U. Um, so one thing that we, one structure, one way to describe the structure that we're considering is to change set to the opposite category of the category of sets. So this is the category where we just reverse all the arrows. Um, and so pi of u is the skeleton of monos and set of sliced over u. Um, but another way to phrase that is instead of dualizing this thing, is to dualize the other words. So it's the skeleton of the set of epis in set uh, co-sliced. Okay, maybe I'll do. Do you like that notation, David? Okay, co-sliced under you. So this means that the, the objects are, have a, a uh, an epimorphism from you to some other set up to equivalence. Um, and in particular, these things are, are partitions. So. Could you just write the equivalent thing you said before? That's mono and yeah, set up okay. you. So and so I an object, or this is just a, a poset, so you might think of these just as elements, uh epis, uh so equivalence class of subjections. Define it that way by turning set into set opt. We have to put it up on the whole outside too, to make sure that. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a good question. Uh, I think you do I to, think make the the yes, to, to make the answer is yes to make the order yeah. work out. Okay. Um, okay. And then so the morphisms in this thing, uh, if we have two partitions. Wait, which one do I want? 
um, I want a is less than, so I want things to go like this. Um, so pi is less, pi is greater than sigma if there's a map from, so these, these things are surjections, and I want a map that sort of clubs things together. So finer things are bigger. So, so finer things are bigger. And which way is, is that up, or should I put the up over there? No, that's, that's right. That's I think right. the up okay. is on, you have two ups yeah. on that side, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, so for example, um, if u is some three element set that looks like this, uh, okay, that's some kind of acceptable notation, then um, pi of u is this post set where the top thing looks like that. Um, we have these partitions, and we have this partition, and we have the sort of coarsest partition guy down there. Oops. So I'm drawing a partition uh, as the circles represent the elements of the set E, the dots represent the elements of the set U, and then uh, a dot maps to the circle that it's in. Yeah. Could you just write that like with all the ops? I'm just having trouble parsing yeah. that. Okay. Equal to mono set up. Sliced over u up. Okay. Um, so, so the logic of the talk so far has been: uh, we know propositional logic is good for power sets. Uh, we can do this thing completely analogous to power sets, either by working the set up or dualizing everything, and then we get the lattice of partitions. So we might suspect that there is a really nice logic for the lattice of partitions. Do you have to keep with the epi's arc in that diagram? Or what the epi's are in that diagram? The dot yeah, yeah. He said the circles are the elements of E. Mm -hmm. So in the top one, there's E has three things, and the bottom one, E has one thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and oh. the map is which circle the dot is in. Also, the arrows are go backward versus the functions, right? Because the functions go oh, from, mm -hmm. yeah, so just okay. our pre-orders. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the oppy things that we've been talking about. Okay, so, so I kind of motivated the fact that there should be some sort of logic for partitions by analogy. Uh, I want to quickly say that we're sort of interested, um, why are we interested? I have I been reading this sort of work in by you. Uh, so one, one reason is things like hypergraph categories or wiring diagrams. Um, so these things talk about the way we have some components and the way things are connected between them. Um, right. And so Another way to think about what's happening here is that we have an equivalence relation. We have all these points which talk about the interface to our um, components, interfaces. And then these sort of wiring patterns partition these points into connected components. Um, these are a bit too close together, but hopefully you get the idea. There's the set here of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 elements. Um, and it's, we have a map from that s set of 10 elements to a set of five elements that sort of describes when, when two ports, when, which might be, say, terminals on some circuits, are connected. And so having a good logic to reason about uh, the way systems are connected uh, is, is something that can come out of a study of the logic of partitions. Um, and this is, this is not only just for circuits, but as we sort of argued in the course, um, like logical expressions or variable sharing things. Are you going to give us an example of a partition logic that's not a subset logic or vice versa? Sure. In fact, no partition logics are subset. 
uh, like no partition lattices as well. Oh, okay, you have the you have the boolean. That's kind of boring. Um, <laughs> they're very different, uh, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, another example, if you remember, if you were here in November, um, there was a talk by David Myers, uh, which has been sort of, which sort of led to some work David Spivak and I have been doing um, on which we've put to term behavioral Mariology. Mariology. Um, and the idea here is that if I, if you want to talk about sort of, it, it, so Mariology is a study of parts or um, the way parts relate to each other. And if you're thinking about a system like, say, say my arm, um, my hand is a part of my arm, and how that's expressed is the fact that you can have sort of some set of behaviors on my arm, and every one of those sets induces or restricts to a behavior of my hand. So uh, if I have sort of a set behavior of an arm, there's a map, a surjection from that to the behavior of my hand. Um, and so the point of this work is to try and think about, say, if I want to think about uh, whether two things are parts of the same whole, uh, what we're interested in is how constraints placed on, on this thing, on, on one thing, are sort of related or transferred to constraints on the other. So, say, the ends of this chalk are part of the same hole, so if I do something to this end, this end has to do something. Whereas these two pieces of chalk are part of different holes, so if I do something here, that thing can do whatever it likes. They're independent. Um, but again, we see this sort of partition bit lattice um, and to talk about the way constraints pass between them. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, let's get to the logical structure of what's going on. Uh, actually, I want to introduce one more notion. Um, so, in, in sort of subset logic, it's very useful to talk about uh, elements. Um, and so, why is that? One way to see why it's useful to reason about elements is that elements are this thing called a separating object. So, an object um, S in C is a separating object Which are not equal to each other, but are maps from C to D. Um, there exists uh, a, a map, let's call it X from S to C, such that if we do X then F, it's not equal to X then G. Right? So, for example, um, in set, just a one element set is a separating object. And what does that mean? Um, well, a map from a one element set to any other set is just an element, say, x of that set. So what this means that says that if f is not equal to g, these are functions, um, then there exists x such that f of x is not equal to f of g. So it's the standard test for equality of functions, but abstracted um, into the structure of a category. So it turns out that this sort of fact about one being a separating object makes the notion of element very useful in studying sort of subset logic. Um, but we're dualizing everything here, so we want to talk about co-separating objects. So a co-separating object uh, is an object such that if we want to tell two maps apart, we can stick it after it. So there always exists some, some map from the co-domain to our co-separating object, such that when we compose these two maps with that map, they, we realize that they're different. Uh, so in set, um, two is a co-separating object. Separating object. Um, so just as uh, we call Function, let's call functions um, one to u elements. Um, I want a name for functions u to two, and that name will be distinctions. 
So partition logic is the logic that distinctions. So is the distinction a map to two or a map to two up to isomorphism? Up to it's a map to two up to isomorphism. Okay. Um, just like an element is a map from one up to isomorphism. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just dualizing everything. Isomorphism up to, okay. Yeah. Okay. So. If you're actually reading one of these papers by Element that I sent out, he uses a, a different definition of distinction, um, which is just that a, a distinction is a pair of elements that are not in the same map to the same thing in the, under the, the partition. So that if you think of a partition as equivalence relation, they're just two in equivalent elements. Uh, but I think that definition is not as well motivated and is responsible for parts of the paper being sort of a little obscure. Um, so two is partition. I will actually tell you some stuff about the logic now. Uh, okay. So partition logic is about distinctions. So a partition describes what distinctions can be made. of partitions is a bit something like this. Um, what is a, a distinction? What is a map to two? Well, it's a way of dividing these five elements into two different sets, right? The one that maps the first element to two and the one that maps the second element to two, where we don't really care whether it's the first or the second. So for example, this is a, an acceptable uh, distinction of, of the partition. Um, similarly, this thing is an acceptable distinction, um, but something like this is not acceptable because it, it slices through partitions. Um, so more formally, um, the idea is that, that we're interested in distinctions because they sort of let us query, this, this co-separating property lets us query the structure of our partition. And so the way we do that is that if we have a partition, so um, if u to e is a partition, um, we say that some map to 2 called d, um, so d, that thing, is a distinction, if pi is a partition, then d is a distinction of that pi can make, or a distinction of pi, in the same way that something would be an element of some subset, if there exists uh, a map here so that these things commute. Um, so what, what this says is that if I wanted to, say, get this yellow distinction, uh, I can map these two to one side of this partition and this, this part to the other part. Okay, so partition, partition lattices are kind of uh, are nice in that they have um, all meets and joins, all finite meets and joins. I guess they have all meets and joins. Um, but I'll tell you the finite ones. So in particular, the top element, uh, which I'm writing one, although David seems to... This is just taken from the paper, so you can take up with that, David. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the, the, the identity partition. So the biggest thing is the, the, the partition where every distinction can be made. Um, all right, so here's the top element. Um, the bottom element, which I'm writing zero, uh, is there's always a one element, there's the one element set, and there's a unique map to one. Right? And this is that 
everything is part of the same part, or that no distinctions can be made. Um, and then, if we want to talk about the meat, um, so, let's, so the meat of two partitions, sigma and it's called pi, um, is the partition, partition describing uh, all distinctions that can be made or that are all distinctions of both sigma and pi. So in particular, uh, what does this look like if we have some thing here and we take it to meet with So they're both partitions on the same four-element set. Um, then the meat of these two partitions uh, is the, lets us make any distinction that we can make in, in both of these things. So it's... Wait, shouldn't it sorry. be... Yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't it be... Yeah. So let me Wait, a better that example. The, shouldn't meats make things coarser? Yes. Yeah. So looks like this. So we can make this distinction in both things. So it's the distinction we can make here. Uh, but we can't make, say, this distinction in both. So it's not a distinction of that. Okay. Uh, the, the join of things is all distinctions of either, so this is inclusive, um, sigma or pi. So, so there's enough to tell you the, the partition to know all the distinction you can make out of it? Yes. Do have, do That's the definition of separating, right. Um, it's enough to know. If you know this map, if you know all the hmm. all the distinctions. Here's an example of a join where so why is this one a join? Uh, because we can make this distinction here, so we can make it there, even though we can't make it here. Um, we can make this distinction here, but it, it doesn't matter if we can't make it there. It's still, because we only require either. Um, but how do we get the top distinction? Okay, the top distinction? Yeah. The one above the one you used. Oh. Did. So there's like a generative. Yeah, it's a generative. We have to take closure. Okay. I should actually. Under. Mm -hmm. compl under complement or something? Under. So you. S I guess. So if you wanted to distinguish. Um, top right. This thing from these things, mm -hmm. you can ask questions here and here to, to separate it out. Does that make sense? <laughs> Enough for now. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's, that requires yeah. some thought, but it can be done. So, so, so I guess you're using like the Boolean operations on two, right? You can yeah. say, mm -hmm. right? So that's, I think, what generates? Yeah, there's another. So if you describe things in terms of equivalence relations, then this is just the intersection of the equivalence relations, and this is the transitive closure of the union of the equivalence relations. Uh, and so but the, the reason I phrase things in terms of distinction is, one, because it's motivated by this notion of a co-separating object, but two, um, it, it sort of has the and, this is, has a flavor of and, and this is a flavor of or which matches our sort of intuition for joins and meets. Okay. So... You have 10 minutes. Maybe. I have 10 minutes. Okay. So, partition lattices are nice in that they have this... Well, that they are lattices. They have meets and joins. Um, 
but they're not quite as nice as uh, subset lattices. For a reason I'll explain. Um, okay. One, one thing first. So you could create some sort of logical language just with these primitives, one, zero, and an or, right? Without implication, without not. Uh, and so according to this paper, uh, Elliman says, so why wouldn't we want to just study that logic? Well, in tautology, um, tautology, um, in a sort of logical theory is an expression that is always equal to one, or true. Um, it sort of means there's this in every equal to one in every model, um, but idea is that true is always equal to true, um, but something like true uh, or some other proposition is always true, because, well, true is true. So, but... Like P and Q equals Q and P? Oh, yes, that's another example. So, oh, wait, no, that involves equals, I haven't... So what are you, yeah, so it's just the things yeah. with one in them? Yeah, I guess I want equals, okay. So, I have trouble interpreting this, this statement. But maybe you'll let's let's allow ourselves equals. Um, so, well, okay. No, a tautology is an expression. I haven't really told you the theory. I guess I'll say and or equals whatever. Um, it's an expression that's always equal to one. So here are some examples of things. Um, so Ellen says that the only partition tautologies. Partition tautologies. Um, and then he sort of is vague, but I think what he means is in one, zero, and or and equals um, are, the tr are trivial, are the trivial ones. No, no implies? No, oh, I implies. guess you can get implies. Okay. I haven't told you how to okay. construct them, are the trivial ones. Um, What's a non-trivial tautology in... Uh, so a non-trivial tautology in, in subset logic is the distributive law. So if he... I mean, you know what this is, but I'll write it out. So this is something that is true in, in subset logic and propositional logic always. Um, that just involves and, or, and equals. Right? So the claim is that if you're just interested in these sort of logical primitives and you're studying partitions, then partitions are completely generic. They have no additional structure. After. In particular, they're not distributed lattices. Hmm? In particular, they're in not. In particular, they're not di always distributed lattices. So there's a. So a tautology is something that'll be interpreted. It's true in every model, right? That's true for every partition lattice. Uh, so, but you don't have to look very hard to find a, a, a lattice that is not distributed as a partition lattice. In fact, as soon as you get three elements, you're you're sunk. Um, and so here's an example. If we take, so let's take these three things and we'll do, we'll call them A, B, and C, and we'll do A and B or C, right? Then A and B or C, well, B or C is true, so A and B or C is A, right? But if we do A and B, that's false, and if we do A and C, that's false. So A and C or, A, A, A and B or A and C is false, is false and false, which is false. So the distributive law is not holding there. Um, and that's sort of uh, a catch that makes it difficult to define uh, implication. So in a Heiting algebra, um, or sort of kind of in general, I haven't told you what a Heiting algebra is, but subset lattices form one of these things. But we define um, implication by the adjunction um, that C is less than A implies B if and only if 
uh, c and a is equal to a is less than or equal to b. All right, so this means that when you have this statement, you have this statement, and vice versa. So the parentheses go around the c. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the usual. So uh, in other words, um, it's this kind of analogous to a hum object, uh, but it's. Uh, so implication is right at joint to meet. That's the general way to define implication with nice properties. But if, if you have a right adjoint to meet, then meet is uh, meet preserves co-limits or, or joins. So this so you only get an implication or you only get an adjunction of this form when meet distributes meet preserves joins or meet distributes over joins, in other words. So because we don't have distributive lattices, we don't have this sort of standard definition of implication. And so what I think is, is one of the interesting parts of this paper is that uh, Elliman proposes a, a definition for implication in partition lattices that seems to have really nice properties. So I'm going to tell you that definition and then some nice properties. And then I'll be done. So in a partition lattice, um, define, so we have two partitions, sigma and pi, and we define sigma and pi to be the partition, oh, let's get that, to contain all distinctions either in pi or not in sigma. So this is similar to this. This has the flavor of this sort of Boolean definition of implication as... Uh, and you have to close up under... You have to close up under the same sorts of things you did there? I don't think so here. Oh. Um, it's automatically a partition. Okay. I think so. But I haven't worked this through and this isn't a different viewpoint that's in the paper. So... Um, but something that is in the paper um, is a sort of an explicit definition of this. So if... Uh, so this thing, what's some way of thinking about this thing? Well, if we have, for each part, um, B of pi, what we do is we see um, if there exists some part C in sigma such that B cont is contained in C, then we, we atomize, we, we divide P up into, uh, we divide this part up into uh, the, the largest partition on, on B. What does that part distinguish from a partition? Uh, if not, leave a lot of uh, part is in, So a partition is a collection of parts, so this partition yeah. has three parts. Okay. Thank you. Right. If not, leave alone. Um, so, this is better understood through an example. So if I have, say, a five element set, and I have this partition sigma, um, and let's say one, two, three, four, five, this partition pi, then sigma implies pi is the partition. Uh, so for every part here, every part here, I check whether it's completely contained in a part here. It is, but it doesn't matter, it's atomized already. We see, check this part, it's not contained in a part of sigma, so it remains. Mm -hmm. We take this part, and it is contained completely in this part, so we atomize that. And that gives us the implication. Um, it's kind of strange, but it has properties. Um, so one is that Sigma implies pi is always, sorry, that's a zero. If we take false and we ask does it imply pi, that's always equal to true. Um, that's a nice property of implication. Another thing is that pi is always less than um, that sigma implies pi for sigma. Uh, that's basically because we did this, what we did is we started with pi and then we just atomized some parts, right? So that's only going to make it bigger. How does less than compare with implies equals true? How does less than 
if a is less than b, does that mean is that the same thing as a implies b is equal to one? Uh, yes. So we have this thing. This was the next thing I was going to write down for the question. Um, I'm not sure why I'm switching to tau, but so this thing is true if and so we can because one is top we can consider that as an equals. So sigma implies pi is true if and only if sigma is less than pi. Um, but the generic this sort of the adjunction would hope for, which is the adjunction where we place, replace 1 with tau, and we do a tau and sigma here, um, this thing only happens in one direction. Um, if this is true, then this is true. The adjunction condition would say the other one direction should be true, but that's not the case, and the, the counterexample to that is the lack of distributivity. Um, okay, so and there's also... Uh, we can define negation, so not pi is equal to zero implies pi. Wait, sorry, pi implies zero. Uh, that would be not sigma. Not sigma is sigma implies zero. Um, and then there's this thing that element introduces, which is sort of interesting for sort of a pi negation. Um, but that's just an alternate symbol for so this thing, zero. Sigma implies pi. Um, Okay, so why introduce that? Let me tell you some. You're kind of over time. But the yeah, theorems. Yeah. Okay. I'll write out two theorems. Um, so, uh, what are, what these theorems do is they relate these. So I've sort of proposed definitions for in, uh, implication, but I haven't given you any evidence that these are reasonable definitions, right? So they should obey some property that makes them behave like we'd expect implication to behave. Uh, and so let's say um, some facts, proposition. Um, so I'm going to call something a partition. So given a formula, because I've given the same symbols, we can interpret it as a logical statement about subsets or logical statements about partitions. And, if it, and so I'm going to use the words partition topology, uh, tautology and uh, subset tautology. And so uh, phi is a partition tautology. Uh, implies that phi is a subset tautology. tautology. There's one fact. Um, and you can sharpen that to uh, phi is a subset Tautology, if and only if this construction called not pi, not pi, phi, uh, partition, let me finish this, tautology, okay, so what, what this means, this, this not, this pi negation is, just implies pi, and this thing is called the girdle construction on, on phi, but basically it behaves like taking the meat with pi. So you take this formula and you take the meat with pi everywhere. You mean for all pi? What? Uh, no. For I any given. So. Well, phi is a subset phi. topology for which pi? For some pi? Maybe that's not interesting. Maybe it has to be for all pi. Yeah, this is what the theorem statement said, and I didn't really get into the proof to figure out why. But the point to notice that I'm trying to get across here, at least, is that these definitions seem to correspond nicely, seem to have similar properties to the, the classical definitions. And so it seems to be good logic. Thanks for your time.